Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ryan Stutzer. I'm one of the senior investment managers here at Sharewise, and we're here this morning with CEO and Executive Director Andrew Coleman. Uh, now, Andrew's been kind enough to allow us his time and expertise regarding his company, Team Invest Private Group. Uh, we're going to kick things off with a brief presentation, just an update from Team Invest, and then we're going to open up the floor to a Q&A. So as always, I'll start things off with a couple of questions. And then we'll open the floor up. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions you'd like me to ask Andrew, please submit them through using the Q and A function on Zoom. I'll ask the way. Andrew, it's all yours, mate. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Ryan, and thank you, Sharewise. Um, it's lovely to be back as well. I was here only a, a couple of weeks ago, just before the FY twenty four results. So, it's lovely to be able to uh, follow up that presentation with a little bit of an update. Um, as always, with, uh, if there's any questions you've got, just feel free to put them in the chat during the presentation. I know Ryan's asked me to hold off answering them to the end, which I'll do, but at least that way they're, they're there for him to review um, as we go. So uh, just the usual uh, important notice and disclaimer, as always with, with the information we provide to the market, it is general purposes only. We're trying not to make forward-looking statements or things because the future is very difficult to predict, but we are all human. So if something slips out of my mouth, just bear that in mind that it is only a best guess if it relates to the future. Uh, but really looking forward to the time with you all today. So in terms of the presentation, I'm just going to run through a little bit about who we are, uh, what it is we do, why we think that makes us pretty unique and a pretty good investment for people, and then just run through some of the case studies so you can see that in action. Because I think sometimes it's um, all well and good to read something on a page, but until you've really understood how it's operating in, in practice, it's never quite the same. So um, tip who we are, really simply, we're an ASX listed investment house focused on compounding knowledge and wealth. And we operate in three verticals. The first is our, our education and advice vertical, which is where we do uh, advice and education for companies, individuals uh, and institutional clients in relation to both their investing operations and also in relation to how to run their businesses better. And it's a little bit upon using that, that lovely quote of Warren Buffett of we're better investors because we're business people and better business people because we're investors. And from that education and advice business, which is where we started, we generate direct actionable insights, which we can put into place in practical applications, both for ourselves and our clients, and then use the results of those to create iterative improvements. And that leads that from that first vertical, it then brings itself to our other two verticals, which are obviously where we deploy our own capital, which is our own balance sheet, which is used in both active and passive investments. And we'll describe that in a second. And then also where we invest other people's capital, which is our funds management business. So the easiest way to think about TIP is that we're an ecosystem that's generating actionable intel for investing, whether that's on public or private markets. And then we're deploying that through a combination of our own balance sheet and other people's balance sheets. When it's on our balance sheet, that then shows up as revenue and profit, obviously, on our gains and losses. And when it's in funds management, our revenue is derived as a proportion of the revenue that our clients make. So it's as simple as that. We invest money into public and private businesses, either our own or other people's. If it's our own, we get the profits of that investing. If it's someone else's, we get a piece of their profits through a combination of management and performance fees. In terms of our track record of success, I think that's pretty important. If you have a business based on the whole idea that education and advice delivers better returns, you should probably be able to back up that you can get better returns. Otherwise, you will very quickly find yourself without clients. And we've done that in our three main verticals of active investments, where we take our own balance sheet and put that at play with business operations, traditionally unlisted businesses, where we've delivered a two point, a more than 2.7 times money on invested capital since we started uh, about 13 years ago. Um, the education business, where we help people and clients become better investors and business people, where we've delivered a 16.27% gross return compounded over 23 years. And then our passive investments, which is our own funds and, and other opportunities. I'll talk to them in a second, but it's really where we go along for the ride there. So we're identifying good management and good businesses rather than trying to be the management or business ourselves. And that's delivered an 11.43% net. So that's after fee compound annual return for our clients since February 2013. And coming back to that, what really makes us unique also gives us our unfair advantage. So we think that that combination of being able to utilise education and advice, both for our own balance sheet and for our clients, gives us three really distinct competitive advantages beyond just the insight generation. 
The first is it allows us to be really niche focused. Um, that means we can make direct investments in the SME sector. So obviously not very large companies. We're talking companies of between sort of 20 to $200 million in revenue. Uh, passive investments in listed assets that are perhaps unloved or, or not as well understood. And that all of that investing in that niche focus benefits from those direct insights that we're generating. So as we get to understand an industry or a knowledge better by being a company advisor, that gives us an opportunity not only to invest in that asset, but in other assets that can benefit from the knowledge that that has created. The second is it gives us access to an incredibly deep network of skills and opportunities. Um, at the moment, inside our education business, we have roughly 600 high net worth investors who are generating insights for us every month under our tutelage. And then we also have all of our corporate advisory clients. And that combined network effectively means lovely, like that old joke about, you know, six degrees of separation or six degrees from Kevin Bacon. Um, the idea being that we can access uh, opportunities and deal flow that we wouldn't otherwise see and get in the room in conversations that otherwise, as a pure uh, fund manager, you wouldn't be able to, to open the door on. And then thirdly, it provides us access to patient capital. Having our own balance sheet in particular, as opposed to funds management, gives us the opportunity to take a very long-term view when we're investing, because instead of a traditional private equity fund that might have, say, a five or seven-year closed-ended horizon, um, we, being our own balance sheet, provided we see reasonable returns, we can hold an asset for however long it takes us to generate the kind of growth and, and opportunity that we see is there. So, you know, as an example on that, um, our very first investment is still on our books in Graham Lusty Trailers, uh, or GLT as it's now called, having rebranded. Um, and that business has been on our books since November 20, or just no, December 2012. So we bought into that 11 years ago and we've continued to invest into growing that business ever since. That doesn't mean we won't, you know, one day exit our position at the right price, but as it continues to have great opportunities ahead of it, and we'll talk about that a bit more later, we've just been able to continually deploy patient capital through our balance sheet into compounding the growth in that operation. On that note, I don't know, sorry, just as an aside, I heard a presentation from Sol Pats quite recently. They talked about that this has been one of the huge advantages they've had, and I, and I couldn't agree more hearing them talk about it, that having patient capital as opposed to a short-ended fund really gives you the opportunity to double down into your best assets and compound their growth in a way where traditionally having to exit just when things are getting good um, actually limits the returns. It's that lovely old idea of you want to grow your flowers and cut the weeds, not cut your flowers and be stuck with weeds, which I think the traditional fund cycle creates as a little bit of a problem. Because for those of you who've been operators of businesses, you'd know that five or seven years is often nowhere near enough to make the really long-term compounding gains that really good investment decisions or really good business decisions can throw out. You sort of get stuck into that problem where five or seven years in, you're just starting to really get the returns that you wanted, and that's when you have to exit. So having patient capital allows us to redeploy that again for another cycle or two or three as, as we see fit. In terms of our leadership and alignment, I think it's always that lovely, it worth bearing in mind that lovely quote of uh, Charlie Mungers that, um, you know, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. So we are very much of the belief that all of our senior management and board have to have skin in the game. Um, at the end of the day, our capital is shareholders' capital. If that's not our money, then there's always going to be a, a problematic conflict there. Um, or at least, uh, you know, information asymmetry there. And so 28% uh, of our share register is owned by management and board. Um, all of that has been either purchased on market, uh, either before we were listed in, in the initial private equity phase or since listing or been earned in exchange for cash earnings. So that idea of people have given up cash rather than being gifted shares. And I think that's just a really important thing that we hold through both at TIP Headco, but also at our private equity operations in the underlying space we don't believe in gifted shares. We don't believe in, in executive options and all of that because in the end, unless you've actually put money up to acquire it, it's just another form of cash. And we've been burnt by that in the past, so we learned from it. Uh, Terry Pratchett's got that lovely quote that wisdom is the result of experience and experience is usually a result of a lack of wisdom. So uh, we've now got wisdom from our, from our experiences. And so these days, all of that equity has been uh, purchased uh, in, in one form or another. Um, we also pay half of our board fees in shares, again, not as issuing of shares, we actually buy those on market. So we set aside half of the board fees every month 
uh, into a in, into a kitty, which is then used to purchase shares on market for the board as a way also of making sure we're not diluting shareholders to increase the ownership for those who wish to buy more. And in terms of expertise, uh, all of our key leaders have worked for global investment bank, global consulting firms and large ASX listed corporates with real world experience. So we have a very big belief that you can't possibly manage other people's money unless you've both managed your own money before, but also been running the kind of businesses that we're going to invest into otherwise. How would you know what's going on? Um, I like quotes, as you probably gather, that Benjamin Graham's always had a lovely one that stuck with me of Wall Street being the only place in the world that you arrive in a Rolls Royce to get advice from someone who caught the subway. So it's our view very clearly that if we're going to be advising those who come in Rolls Royces, whether they're business owners, institutional clients, high net worth individuals, um, our people maybe don't have to arrive in a Rolls, but they at least have to have the level of expertise that says they can have a conversation at that level about real world events rather than just being um, you know 19 or 20 straight out of university because I think um, we all remember being that age I certainly do I'm sure all of you do as well and uh, we had a, a very outsized confidence relative to our ability I think uh, you need you need to be knocked around the heads a few times with real world experience in order to understand what you know and what you don't know and in investing obviously that's critical. In terms of our strategy, uh, our strategy is pretty simple. It's to continue growing our share of revenue and earnings of the companies we own, which we call look through revenue and earnings, by enhancing our portfolio where we already own them, delivering efficiencies and developing management to grow profits. When it comes to passive investments, it's compounding our advantage through increasing our funds under management and funds under advice. You know, those insights that we're generating every time we invest an extra dollar, we earn more. So, you know, if the kitty that we get to play with is larger, our earnings go up commensurately. And then in the acquisition side of our business, which of course we're doing all the time, we're always looking for attractive prices for both active and passive investments, where we have a material knowledge advantage. And that's really the key thing. What is our unfair advantage? What's the insight that we have about that space that perhaps others don't? And how can we leverage that to make an outsized return for all of us as shareholders in TIP? Or if it's through our clients' money on funds, how can they get an outsized return by paying us in effect for the knowledge that we have. Now, I showed this slide last time I was here. I just think it's really useful to understand our business, which is that the, the sources and uses of our cash during FY24. And really what it shows, it says that we are a very cash generative business. Um, one of the, the classic problems often when you invest in people in the financial services space, right, is that the PL disconnects quite heavily from the cash flow statements, both positively or negatively. Uh, and so I think it's really useful to ask, you know, that question of where's the money going? How much are you actually generating in cash and, and where are you using it rather than just looking at PL and balance sheet movements? And so in FY24, we, we generated six and a half million roughly of cash flow um, through operating cash flow and sale of assets. And obviously sale of assets is a pretty standard part of our business. You know, we, we're buying and selling assets all the time. So that number isn't, you know, a one off or abnormal. That's, pretty standard for us. Um, and then we invested that into a combination of replacement and growth capex for our existing portfolio, which is about half the money, and then the other half of the money roughly on new investments. Um, and that's really key to understand, I think, for, for a potential shareholder in TIP or an existing shareholder in TIP, we are constantly looking at where can we deploy our balance sheet, both into our businesses to improve their return on equity and, and returns to us as the owner, and into new investments where we can get an outsized return on our capital. And I've talked a little bit about this in my annual reports, and I'm sure some of you have read them, uh, but you know, we're looking for a minimum 15% return on our active capital. So when we go into an investment in the private equity space, we're looking to achieve a minimum 15% return. And when it's in the passive space, we drop that to about 10 because obviously there's a bit less risk, but you know, we're sort of looking for double digit returns on a risk adjusted, really low risk basis. And that's really key. You know, as we keep generating more cash, we will keep investing it. And that we expect will flow back into the top of the funnel as new returns, which increases the pile of cash we'll have next year in order to do that all again. So there's sort of a natural compounding that occurs through our cash cycle that I don't think traditional accounting picks up because it's, you know, point in time analysis. Whereas the waterfall, I think, can, can show that a bit better. 
Um, in terms of our revenue and EBITDA by business type, I talked about this two weeks ago, a few weeks ago in the last sharewise one, but it's nice to show, I think, the change, which is why I put this slide up. Uh, in FY23, uh, we generated roughly $160 million in revenue, which was pretty similar this year. Uh, but our EBITDA went from, or look for EBITDA, went from just under $16 million to just under $18 million. And the biggest driver of that was twofold. About half of that growth came from our existing private equity portfolio. And the other half came through the returns on our passive investments, which are a very growing part of our business. So I just highlight that to show that the passive investment piece was only 4% of EBITDA in FY23. It's 11%, was 11% in FY24. And, um, you know, depending on how it goes, but I would expect that percentage to increase over time. Um, not because the other side of our business is shrinking at all, it's growing and it's generating greater returns, but we can get an extra leverage in the passive space um, that we can't always get in the active space. And I'll, I'll talk to that in a second. In terms of our active investments, which is the bulk of our business at 89% of group EBITDA, uh, that's the revenue and EBITDA breakdown for last year. Um, really, I think all I wanted to show in this slide is that the, the diversification of the portfolio remains very much diversified. We had a very good year in our traffic control business, which obviously means it was overrepresented compared to previous years in EBITDA for the year. Uh, but again, that was just because it had a really good year and, and I've, we've got an incredible management team there. So I hope they continue to do that. But I know that the teams at all the other companies are already seeing that and working on ways to claw back some of the pie uh, by growing their businesses faster. But really our business breaks down on average to be roughly a third uh, by uh, earnings out of the engineering space, a third by earnings out of services and a third uh, out of education and technology. And we try to maintain that. So obviously this year has been very, very good in the services space. Uh, other years have been better for engineering or for education or technology, but we're sort of always looking to maintain those three buckets um, within reason. So, you know, obviously on that note, um, that gives you a little bit of an idea for where our M&A heads at right now. Uh, but, you know, that'll, that'll be shifted based on the market at any time. In terms of our active investments, we typically hold between 10 and 20 assets. It's a quite concentrated portfolio of, of businesses where we can materially get in and, and add a difference. I think if that portfolio was 50 businesses, we'd be kidding ourselves that we could actually go in and help them. Uh, you know, there just wouldn't be enough hours in the day for our team. And we're focused really on stable founder-led businesses that can benefit from a combination of mentorship and capital. And that's really the key advantage we have in the active space is that we have patient capital which is nice compared to, you know, a bank on rolling 12 term, 12 month terms or a traditional PE fund on a five or seven year horizon. But even more importantly, that capital comes with the access to the education and advice component that we've been doing for so long. Because I think the biggest challenge for most uh, medium sized businesses is that they reach a level where they've grown to the level of their competence, sorry, their confidence, but not competence. So they've sort of reached a point where they are scared about growing further because they've either got to go into a new niche or take on more risk or remortgage the house or do something. But they actually could do so much more if they were just freed up to focus on the strategically good challenges or good opportunities and provided the capital to make that transition. And that's really what we get when I talk about an outsized opportunity. We're looking for businesses where we, we can see with them a path to materially increase their earnings. That needs a little bit of our knowledge and capital combined with what they've already got. We're not trying to go into startups or, or brand new businesses where we've got to put in you know, everything. And similarly, you know, if the business is, is huge and, and doesn't think it needs any of our help and it just wants some cheap capital, the banks own that space. So we're really looking for that space where it's a combination of mentorship and capital to unlock material growth and material returns over the long run. And we're looking for long run in that case. Those businesses, therefore, being active tend to be predominantly unlisted businesses. And that's for two reasons. Number one, I just think they tend to be. There are more unlisted businesses in this country than listed ones. You know, there's just under 2,000 companies on the ASX and there's many times that number that are privately owned. But again, from a returns point of view, it just makes a lot of sense. If we believe we've got the confidence and knowledge to go in and assist, and so we therefore don't need the same liquidity uh, profile that if you had less confidence, you'd need, because with less confidence, you want to be able to get out at a, at a moment's notice, um, then buying in the unlisted space where transaction multiples are typically four to seven times historical net profit after tax immediately gives you a better opportunity to maximise your returns than if you're buying on market where PEs are, for most companies, um, you know, sort of north of 20 times at the moment. You just get an immediate value or return uplift from being able to take advantage of your 
your ability to have less liquidity because you've got an, an, a, a competitive advantage on the knowledge element. And now patient intelligent capital is a strong advantage for the companies we invest in and also therefore for those who, who invest in us. And our goal with those investments is simply to keep growing them to deliver a significant multiple on our money invested. That's what MOIC means. It's money on invested capital. In other words, how much cash has the business given us back or profits has it given us back relative to what we had to put in? Um, or alternatively, we look to exit them. So quite often you'll see turnover in our portfolio. That turnover is for one of two reasons. It's either because strategically that business was no longer going to deliver us the future growth that we thought we could get elsewhere. So we're unlocking that capital to redeploy. Or it's simply because in, in the words of Kerry Packer, you only get one Allen bond in your lifetime. Um, every now and then someone will come and offer us a price that's just too good to refuse. And whilst we're not actively shopping around for that, uh, we'd be mugs if we said you know, no to a price that just, just made too much sense. A couple of case studies in the in the active investment space. Um, East Coast Traffic, because obviously it was the biggest contributor to our active EBITDA this year. Uh, that's a business that we initially acquired in 2014 from a founder who uh, had sort of got to an age where he didn't want to be involved in running the business anymore. And he didn't really have a second level of management or team that could take over and deliver the business. Um, we found out, as often is the case, there's a little bit more to things than at first appear when we got in. It turned out the industry was actually, let's just say, uh, not quite as clean as an overall industry as we had thought. Uh, the traffic control industry, for those who don't know, originally was started mostly off the back of security guards providing traffic control. And um, the security industry, particularly in um, certain parts of Australia tends to have been dominated by some pretty unsavoury types. That has been cleaned up by significant investment, both from the government and from those of us who are more um, corporate players in the space. And obviously we're one of those, but it was an interesting eye opener. <laughs> it was the first time I'd had to deal with that, um, which was quite interesting. But the advantage we have in that space, really, if you think about it uh, quite simply, is that traffic control is a very low cost part of a very large project, that if it's not there, has materially big problems. So if you're doing a road construction or you're building a, a big building that you need to shut down a road for or moving a wind turbine, if the traffic controller is unprofessional or late or not very safe, not only do you take huge OH&S risk on your very large team, but you may have to shut your site down for many hours to rectify the problem. And quite often it might be say three traffic controllers on site, but 300 other people. And so the cost to the company of having um, under-resourced or not as professional traffic control is actually a material risk that they don't otherwise budget for. And that was the big shift in the market. The market's now come to understand that more. And as a process, those of us who are, or as a result, those of us who are more professional and well-run and more locally focused in regional areas as we can be, which means we're more responsive, um, we've just got such growth ahead of us that, that um, it's really a matter of them, uh, trying to get the traffic controllers to meet the demand. And that's really the, the Greg Jekyll and the CEO there and his team have, have really taken the bull by the horns on that challenge and, and really, I think, lifted the game in regional areas in traffic control. So it's a great business that we've been in now for um, 10 years and wholly owned it for six of them. And it's one that, that I think just is going to, well, is delivering great returns and is likely to keep delivering great returns for many years to come. Another case study I mentioned it earlier was the very first investment we made, which was in GLT. Uh, this is an interesting one. Again, a baby boomer owner, uh, doyen of the traffic control industry, uh, sorry, of the uh, tra uh, trailer industry, a guy named Graham Lusty, um, who had founded another business in the space many years before that became a core part of Maxi Trends. And they really, what GLT's purpose was, was to focus on building the highest quality lowest tear weight trailers on roads. So for those who are not very familiar with the logistics industry of bulk haulage, every extra tonne that you can save on the weight of your trailer results in an extra tonne of product you can move. Usually those trailers are not full to the brim when they're on road. They're actually maxing out on weight, not on, but on volumetric capacity. And so if you can do things to engineer those trailers better, to be lower weight, higher, uh, you know, faster to remove their contents or loads, safer, et cetera, that provides a material advantage for the haulage company. We're talking doubling of margins for the haulage company, that kind of level material advantage. And so, of course, anytime you can add a material uh, capacity to your customer to make more money, that gives you an opportunity to price in a more premium way and steal market share. And that's what GLT has been doing since we 
first acquired a stake in them in 2013. At the time, they had about 30 staff and were operating in a pretty small facility in Queensland. And um, for those who are following our ASX announcements, you'll see that during 2024, uh, we just took a, a new space uh, to double capacity again, uh, which means we're roughly now 10 times the size by capacity that we were when we first went in. Uh, and in terms of by revenue, we're probably about seven times the size already. So we've got a long way to grow, um, but still in that space. And um, the team there, you know, next generation has been transferred over to really well. So uh, led now by Shay Chalmers um, and, and other some great engineers in that team. And they're really just taking GLT from strength to strength. And I think GLT is a really great example of where in the private space, um, if you've got patient capital, you can get the kinds of returns, in this case, 6.7 times our money already, but you just struggle to get in the public space or with a, a fund manager that needs to turn the asset over every few years. You know, we've been in that asset now for uh, 11 years and it roughly makes today every year what we paid for it originally. So each extra year we hold it with that growth profile materially increases our returns by an order of magnitude compared to the usual sort of 10, 15, 20% you're aiming for per annum. And that's just because we've been able to compound. You know, compounding really is a true wonder. And if you can compound for longer, with patient capital, and you can add some advice into that to, to make that, you know, even larger, the overall opportunity, the returns you can get really do dwarf what you can get in most other spaces. A third case study, uh, and the last of my case studies on the active investments is the Team Invest business, which was originally obviously our, our core operation, uh, which is the provider of investment education and the developer and owner of a proprietary stock filtering and valuation software. Today, Team Invest has grown to have roughly 1.6 billion under advice and that aggregate holding, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, puts us in the top 20 shareholders uh, in 27 ASX listed companies. Uh, we've wholly owned the business since 2021. Until that time, it was still partly owned by its founders and facilitators. Now those founders and facilitators are um, part of the holders of you know, Team Invest, so the tip group. So, you know, they've got shares in us as opposed to uh, shares directly in Team Invest, uh, and it delivers a reasonable return. In understanding Team Invest, though, we sort of think of it a little bit, and you'll see why, uh, a little bit like NRMA's roadside assist model. So in the sense that it needs to wash its face, it needs to make a reasonable return on capital so that no one ever says, why do you own the thing? But the value that it provides is in the knowledge that it gives for the rest of the portfolio rather than in the profits that it makes itself. And I use that NRMA example because our chair, Malcolm Jones, was obviously at one point the CEO of NRMA uh, before he moved on to be the CEO of Zurich. And it was a really key differentiator for NRMA, for those of you who understand it well, that because they had the roadside assist data, they could price and make better returns out of their insurance offering. And I think that's the way you want to look at Team Invest for us at Tip Group. Our goal with Team Invest is to not lose money because then someone might say, just like with NRMA roadside assist, why don't you cut the service or cut the costs? But provided it's making a reasonable return, we don't want to try and maximise the return from Team Invest by putting up prices or something like that. What we want to do is maximise the insights, the value of the insights that it's generating, because those insights are worth so much more to us if we can deploy them in private equity or funds management than an extra few dollars on a membership or charging for education would be worth, just worth understanding that. Switching over to our passive investments business, which is about 11% last year of our earnings. Um, that's really our funds management trustee registry and administration services. And it breaks down that our revenue last year was roughly half for advice. So assisting businesses and, and institutional clients, roughly half on our own funds management, whether that was through others, which I've broken out onto the graph in the lighter blue or our own investments, liquid investments, which is in the, in the black. Um, and that liquid investments grew in, in 2024 from 1.4 million to five and a half million. So really what we've done is rather than, and what we do is that rather than sitting on cash when we don't have a good private equity opportunity uh, available, we will invest in the same listed assets that we are advising our clients to invest into, which gives us a lovely return and builds us a portfolio uh, over time. And really it's an almost no marginal cost to us to do so. We're effectively deploying the same insight we're already creating for others into our own balance sheet to maximise returns rather than having dead capital lying around. 
case studies in the passive space. Uh, I won't touch on these in a huge amount of detail because I think you can read them all on the ASX announcement and the passive space probably needs a little less explaining. It's pretty obvious it's passive. <laughs> you know, we're managing other people's money or investing in something. Uh, but the Conscious Investor Fund has been our flagship fund since it was established in February 2013. Uh, we have formally acquired half of it in 2022 rather than keeping it on the side. Uh, and it delivered 28% of our passive revenue last year um, and most importantly has continued to deliver outstanding returns after fees for the clients that are in it because I think again taking Buffett's lovely comment of there's only three things you need to do to be successful in business the first is continually delight your customers the second is re obsessively remove unnecessary costs and the third is to innovate to do the first two better and in the case of funds management that's really what we need to do delight our customers and obsessively remove unnecessary transaction and other costs that are friction on the returns that those investors get. The Corinthian Balance Fund is our charity only fund. Um, that's an interesting one. We started uh, about two years ago now. We realized that in the NFP and charity space, they were being very poorly serviced. So we developed an NFP only fund. And that again has delivered very good returns uh, on a compounding basis for in the charities within that. They obviously have a much lower risk profile than, than a straight equities fund, so it's never going to do quite as well as the Conscious Investor Fund, but it's doing very well relative to its comparison points, and I think the charities are very happy who are in it. And then just lastly, touching briefly on our, our group financial position, uh, as I said before, um, our revenue was about flat on last year, mostly, by the way, due to the exit of or wind down of a couple of our businesses. So um, we didn't get their revenue, but then we didn't, you don't have to worry about any of their other operational issues. Um, and our look through EBITDA grew materially. And just from a KGAR perspective, since FY17, and I only use FY17 because that was the first year of consolidated accounts getting ready for our IPO. Before that, they were all in SPVs. And so from a, a truly like-for-like -like comparison, it's difficult. Um, we've had a 4% per annum look through revenue KGAR, but a 53% per annum look through EBITDA KGAR. And that's where I was talking a little bit about the disconnect between accounting numbers and cash. Uh, because we're turning our portfolio over on a not super active basis, but every now and then, our revenue keeps getting crimped every time we exit something, but our profits don't and neither do our cash flow. So it's just worth bearing that in mind that um, it, there is obviously eventually a theoretical ceiling. You can't earn more in earnings than you have in revenue, right? But um, as a percentage of revenue, earnings should go up over time as we double down into our best investments exit others that are maybe not performing as well and redeploy that capital for better uses. So I think that um, expectation that earnings will continue to grow faster than revenue is something that in the long run, we're very much confident of. Um, whether that'll happen in any individual year, one never knows because the markets can do <laughs> weird things to you. But over the long run, we expect that will continue as we continue to water our flowers and um, prune the weeds. And in terms of our group balance sheet, um, really all to talk about here, we got about $5 a share in assets, uh, $3.10 a share in book equity, um, but net tangible assets of about $1.62 a share, if you prefer that measure. And we're sitting on about $0.24 cents a share in cash. So of our current market cap, um, effectively, that points out, you know, we're on a very, very low price to book ratio um, and obviously on an incredibly low uh, EV to EBITDA ratio um, of about 1.6 times, which is a bit ridiculous in my opinion, but then, you know, it's a market and um, everyone can make their own decisions as to whether they like it or not. But really that, just to highlight that if you understand our story um, and you like our story, which of course is, is up to you, we are trading at the moment on very low multiples relative to both our book equity, our cash holdings, our NTA and an earnings metric. And obviously each person will have your own way of calculating what you think a, a good metric to be using is. But I thought it was just easier to set that out for you than um, maybe rely on you to have to do that analysis yourselves. That's everything from me from the presentation. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, you really appreciate the presentation there. Now, I'll just kick things off with a couple of questions I've got here. If any participants would like to submit any questions now, please do so for the Q&A and I will ask them. Now, the first one I've got for you, Andrew, this, well, this afternoon is obviously, you know, you demonstrated that you guys have managed to deliver 13.3% growth in look-through EBITDA. Now, can you just explore what look-through actually means as a metric and what are the main business units that have driven this growth? Yeah, sure. I might just show this slide because it's... Oh, actually, um, yeah, this slide's probably the easiest one. So um, look-through is really simple. It's the idea that 
take a step back from accounting standards for a second, but on a common sense basis, we are entitled to our proportional ownership of a company's revenue or EBITDA. So if we own 100% of a company, then we should be entitled to 100% of its revenue or earnings. Pretty common sense. If we own none of a company, then we're entitled to none of its revenue or earnings. And if we own, say, half of a company, we're entitled to half its revenue and earnings. So look through is using exactly that approach, taking the percentage we own and multiplying it by the underlying revenue and earnings of the company. Why we use that metric, of course, is for those who, who understand accounting standards, that is not how accounting standards work. Accounting standards have certain touch points that convert you from effectively taking no revenue or earnings to 100% with minorities and all sorts of other weird and wacky combinations in between. And so as we constantly are changing the percentage we own of businesses, either acquiring more or selling down to management, that then creates a jumpiness. Think of it like a sine curve in our statutory accounts that just don't reflect the underlying performance of the business. So I'm not arguing they're wrong. They make perfect sense for the as accounting standards for the vast majority of businesses. But for businesses that are a portfolio that is moving, the accounting standards just mean sort of weird things can occur in the numbers. And so from understanding the business point of view, we look at it on a look through revenue and earnings basis. Um, and we encourage people who look at us to look look at it on the same basis with the idea being that that will tell you how the portfolio is performing and you're really owning a portfolio by owning us rather than potentially what the accounting standards did in any one year. Okay, we'll appreciate the clarification on that front. Now, I'm just focusing down on the private equity component of uh, the company. Now, with your private equity investments, how do you compare to your peers and realistically, how are your peers in the competitive market? Yeah, look, the private equity space is interesting, right? Because I think that everyone knows the name of some of the really big ones. I'll just take you to the, the active investments. Actually, this page is probably useful, um, you know, in the sense of the PEPs and the KKRs and all of those. Realistically, they aren't our competitors. Um, I would love to one day be in a position where we can write a $5 billion or $20 billion check for an asset, but that's not us. And so they're not in our, in our comparative sport. Our competitors, are, when it comes to investing in businesses, almost always a trade buyer. So when we're looking at buying someone, usually the founder's uh, options are handed over to their staff in the hope with a vendor loan, in the hope that they'll pay them back, hand it to their kids, you know, transfer the asset within the family or sell it to a competitor. Yeah. And the reason for that is simply that there are so many businesses out there in the private space who are, you know, 20 to 200 million revenue, really good businesses that are too small to be attractive to the very big global players and too big to be bought by one or two people with money. So I think if you drop down that curve, you would see that our competitors would be anyone who wants to own a business. You know, I think if you're selling a cafe or whatever, you know, there's a thousand buyers. And if you go up the curve, you get all the big global ones. But if you're sort of looking at writing a check between sort of two and a half million and 50 million, there's not a lot of people that can do that in Australia. And there hasn't been since we started. We, we are very rarely in an auction. Um, that's a really important point around why the multiples we pay are low, but it doesn't mean the businesses we buy are going to be any good, right? You still need to do your due diligence and understand your industry because just because you're buying a business that looks cheap doesn't mean it's going to make you any money, right? But in terms of that um, opportunity to, to play within the space, we really don't have a lot of direct peers. Um, and I've seen over the last sort of 13 years, a lot of people start up in this space, spoken to lots of them and become friends with them. And they've suffered from a little bit of a problem, which is that, if you are a fund manager, as opposed to using your own balance sheet, buying one small business isn't enough to give you a big enough fee to keep going. So you have to build a portfolio of these assets. And the problem, of course, is that people with capital tend not to want to give you enough to have a portfolio of these assets until you've proven yourself. So you get stuck in this sort of catch-22 of you buy one asset, maybe a great asset, and then they say, great, seven years later, tell me how it's gone, and I might give you some more money. And so from our perspective, we constantly find we have startup competitors, but no one who's been able to really replicate the model in the scale that we're in. And, and we think that's a distinct advantage. Unfortunately, though, for the country, it's not a good thing. I would love to see us have more competitors in that space, because I think if you, if you accept that the baby boomer generation is going to provide the largest transfer of business ownership wealth in history, because it's been so entrepreneurial, and then you realise that the vast majority of buyers out there don't exist, that's um, not good for the economy, even if it might be great for the acquirer. Okay. All right. Well, I really appreciate that understanding there. Now, your active investments have generated well over half your financial year 2024 earnings. Um, but TRP Group is starting investing more into the passive part of the business. 
Can you tell us more about the passive investment and where you see this business going over the next three or five years? Absolutely. Look, passive investing is the easiest thing for us to do. I know that sounds a bit trite, but really what we're doing is we're taking the insights. We're already deploying, be that in our education business or in our active portfolio, and just doubling it down where we don't need to be the one running it ourselves. And so, as you can imagine, it's therefore much faster to deploy the capital. Uh, there's more liquidity usually because we're buying listed assets rather than unlisted assets. And so both as a store of wealth, somewhere to place our cash while we're looking for the next acquisition, it's materially better than leaving it in a bank transaction account. So you know, we'd, we'd be silly not to be doing that. Uh, but secondly, also it, that compounding value means that it's going to compound at a rate um, almost as fast as the active portfolio, but with a, a more regular compounding. So the problem with active investing, as you can imagine, is you spend you know six months doing due diligence on an asset and then you maybe buy it. So there's this sort of lumpiness of when you can deploy capital. And so in the long run, that evens out because, you know, you're talking 10 years, lumpiness doesn't matter. But in the short run, it creates very lumpy statutory accounts year to year, whether we're buying something or not or which asset we buy. The passive investment space maybe doesn't give you quite as high a percentage compounding, sort of think 10, 12 versus 15, 20, but you can do it from day one and you can move it much faster between them. And so over time, as our cash holdings continue to grow, as the earnings continue to come off our portfolio, I'd expect that you see more and more of that passive money, that cash deployed into passive investments where it will compound a return. Because for us, it's a no-brainer. We, we know we can get good returns. We know we've got experience doing at it, and it makes so much better than putting, it makes so much more sense than putting it in cash while we wait for the next active opportunity. Well, thank you for that one. It makes complete sense. Now, with your education business and your conscientious investor funds, obviously you've delivered excellent, consistent returns over the long term. With 16.3 grand of compounding over 23 years for the education and then 11.4 for the conscientious investor fund, realistically, how do these both work simultaneously? Yeah, so look, the, the one is the education business, which is a, a theoretical portfolio. So, you know, buying what we effectively have as a, a target portfolio, you put it in normal terms. We don't call it that, but it, if, you know, the companies we like. Uh, and that portfolio is therefore calculated, obviously, on a gross basis because we don't know what anyone's individual tax or holding costs or brokerage fees would be. Uh, whereas, of course, the portfolio in the Conscious Investor Fund, 11.4, uh, that's a net return after all of those all of those costs. So I, I would say your argument is probably if you used exactly the same period rather than 23 years versus uh, the 11 years, um, yeah. the number would be pretty much the same less the transaction costs and tax. That's really the, the differential. But um, obviously I can't prove that because I don't have exactly that data. So we present them as two separate figures. And that's just something for people to be aware of if I can give one piece of advice, which is in the funds management game, the vast majority of funds present their gross returns because it looks better. Um, I've never been a believer in that. We present net returns on all of our funds because I think it doesn't matter what the manager got. What matters is what did you as the investor get? Uh, and so we always present a net number, but that um, isn't always the case in the industry. Now, just to refocus back on the active uh, active investment component of the business, can you talk through um, with your uh, current investments how you really realistically look at them from an M&A focus perspective? And look, we, we, I'll just go to the active slide because I think that can highlight it a bit for you. Um, we're always looking at a couple of things. I'll, I'll take it from the company's perspective and then the portfolio perspective. So if you take a company like GLT or East Coast Traffic, we're always asking ourselves two questions, right? The first is how do we grow this business in general as the operator of the business, you know, as you would in any business case? And the second one is where can we use the group's networks, capital and insights to increase that growth rate? So, you know, GLT might be growing in its space really nicely. And we're then asking the question, how do we get a higher growth rate by deploying some more capital or um, another insight into the space? So that immediately, I think, probably throws up some obvious opportunities. The first is bolt-on acquisitions. Because our companies, because they have access to our balance sheet, are not capital constrained in the way that they would be if they were standalone businesses. We have the opportunity to make attractive bolt-on purchases. And we've done that at a number of businesses over the years. And the second thing is we can buy into adjacencies where we can say, well, look, it doesn't make sense for this business to do this other thing. But because of the knowledge we have in that business, owning the sister company is really advantageous. And so if you look at it with GLT and Icon Metal, and that, that was why I was touching on GLT before, you can see that at play. So Icon Metal uh, was historically a construction-focused business that did architectural metalwork, artwork, staircases, that kind of thing. 
But really what that meant is they were really, really top fabricators and engineers of steel. That's really what they were doing, steel and glass. And if you think about GLT, whilst GLT is a manufacturer of trailers, very you know, low weight, high volume, technologically advanced trailers, in effect, what are they at the end of the day from a manufacturing process? They're an engineer of steel and aluminium. And so when you combine those two skill sets, you realize there's a hell of a lot of overlap between the businesses from a knowledge basis, even if not an end customer or end product base. And so because we have that portfolio from an acquisition point of view, we can target those adjacencies of overlap to materially increase the value to both businesses in a way where you couldn't if you were just in one. So as a good example, last year, Icon Metal actually did the R&D for a very new trailer design for GLT in the yeah. waste industry, uh, which is, we think, quite revolutionary and game-changing. Effectively, you can take 40 tonnes of waste and dump it in a few seconds on its side without the, the, the um, centre of gravity of the trailer shifting. So the problem in the waste industry has always been that, you know, you're driving these garbage trucks and things on road and then the centre of gravity is always shifting, so they can tip over, knock a pole line over, you know, do some damage, yeah. potentially injure people. This completely removes that problem. Now, that was an idea that came out of GLT, but required a level of engineering and construction knowledge that a logistics company wasn't going to have. And so we were able to use the, the team of engineers at, at Icon Metal, who used to deal with very large cantilevered architectural problems, and apply that cantilevering knowledge into the hydraulics of the GLT business. And so that's opened a whole new market for us that didn't exist. We haven't you know, got into that market yet much because it's brand new, but that waste industry is a whole new market for GLT and, and you know, could be worth many times the current market. We've just got to keep growing to one day get there um, because we have those sister adjacencies that you can't get normally in a traditional engineering business that is focused on making widgets and doesn't have access to, to those other things. And that's why I talk about the portfolio is both a combination of individual businesses which have value and, and we're growing them. And also we're asking where can we deploy our capital into those businesses and adjacencies to increase the value of the whole. So that's sort of third, a third, a third model. Oh, well, thank you for that deeper discussion. I've just got one more from me and then we'll give it to some last oh. new questions. Uh, last time I've is obviously you mentioned before that being a listed private equity firm gives you guys some of the, you know, some advantages. So I'm only appearing to be cash capital. Uh, again, what realistically does this mean in the M&A sense from a competitive advantage point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think it gives two big competitive advantages. The one that we're not using at the moment for obvious reasons, which is that you can use equity instead of cash to potentially make an acquisition. But with where we're trading right now and the fact that we're buying back shares, we'd be silly to be issuing them. So that, that's not on the cards, but it could be one day. But I think more importantly, um, and I was talking about this only yesterday, so it's a good question. Um we have a distinct advantage over the traditional closed-end fund model by being listed, which is if you think about it, and Sol Pats has the same advantage, right? If you think about it, you have this classic problem as a private equity firm. We've talked about that already. Of You get to your five or seven-year end and you have to recycle the capital. Yeah. Now, that in itself is a problem, but you have a bigger problem on top of that, which is that it very rarely works out that 100% of your assets can be sold for a good price on the day you need to exit. You know, normally there's ups and downs, some markets are going up, some are down, and so some of your assets you have to get out at a good price, that's great, and other assets that are potentially at a much lower price or you're stuck holding them. And that is part of the reason, I think, why for investors in private equity, it's often had a bad name because you get to the end of your fund life and you're stuck. Either you're stuck with a lower return than you thought you were getting from your statements all the way along, or you're forced to roll over into another fund, you know, the traditional fund A to fund B model. Yeah. The advantage we have being listed, number one, we have liquidity for those people who are in the business. But also, more importantly, if we ever get to a position where we think an asset is, is too good or deserves to be better on its own or just shouldn't be part of our portfolio, we can actually do a demerger in a way that a traditional PE firm can't. Because if you're a traditional fund model, how would you take an asset, let's say GLT is you know, huge by itself and it needs to do something on its own, how could you take that out of your portfolio and hand that to your investors? It would be impossible for a whole bunch of tax and other reasons. But as a listed company, we could take the approach that so many other listed companies have done over the years, which is to do a simple demerger, script for script, so all the shareholders of TIP become shareholders in both TIP and NUCO, and then that company is standalone by itself, ready to go without a massive loss of value in that transfer, you know, by selling it at a, a bad price or a bad time. And that, I think, is a really valuable point that we haven't seen play out yet because we've only been listed for five years. But, you know, longer term, I think, is a real advantage that we have that a traditional fund model doesn't. And I'm really excited to test that 
at the right time with the right asset because I think that that materially unlocks value um, for shareholders in a much, much better path than just selling something for less than it's worth or rolling it over. Okay, well, thank you for that one. That does make it completely better. That's actually very, very important. Now, just pivoting now to some last minute questions. First one I've got here is, are uh, team invest focus on investments with a ROC slash ROE of greater than 10, with TIP itself having an ROC slash ROE of less than five, uh, and a bit of growth has been low over the last four or five years. Can you comment on the key drivers for this low performance of TIP and when we should expect to see some improvement on this? Yeah, sure. Look, I think there's two things there. I think firstly, there's, this is the danger of using statutory accounts, and I don't argue why people should or shouldn't, but statutory accounts versus look-through accounts. Our statutory accounts are lumpy and they go all over the shop because of the reasons we just talked about around portfolio rebalancing. Whereas if you look at it on a look-through basis, that's absolutely not the case of what's been occurring, as you can see on that slide. Uh, but I think the second thing is to also to that point is to understand or to think about what the right equity measure is. And I say that again with all love for accounting standards. I, I use them <laughs> obviously every day in, in what we do as an, an investor. But um, in terms of capital we ever raised from people, we only ever raised about $25 million as tip. So both listing and prior, add it all together, all of our SPVs, we've taken about $25 million off, off investors. And on that $25 million, we now make just under $18 million a year. So our return on active equity, if you want to think of it that way, is... What's that? Just under 70%, somewhere around that number per annum. However, because we listed at a, a price of a dollar a share, uh, which since because we did a five for one consolidation would be $5 a share in, in today's numbers, our balance sheet equity is based off that original market cap, which I think is $90 million. So if you look at that number and you compare a statutory profit, which is being moved around, but even a look-through profit to 90 mil, you're getting very different numbers depending on which one you use. So I internally judge our management team based on the simple question of how much money did you take from people and what are you delivering out, money on invested capital? Because I think that's the real measure. But depending on which measure you pick, you'll get different numbers. So 17.8 divided by 90 shows close to 20% return, good, but not as good as 70 you know, statutory number of, say, four divide, or six, you know, operating divided by 90 obviously shows a much lower return. So as an investor, I think this is one where if you like us, and it's obviously up to you if you do, just do a little bit of the digging through, you know, I set all this out in my letters and these presentations, because I think that'll give you a much better picture of what's going on than the statutory accounts that they are accountingly accurate, audited to the nines, and, you know, my team's very good at that and the auditors are great but they capture these big movements based on statutory accounting standards that just aren't actually there in the portfolio. You know, when we, uh, as an example this year, and it's in my letter, um, we were, because we're in a court case in relation to one of our assets, we wrote off a, a, about $9 million, $10 million from our balance sheet. Yeah. Now that's a non-cash write-off. Like, obviously we don't know what will happen. We hope to win the court case. But if we win the court case, we get money. If we don't win the court case, we still have an asset. It just may not be worth the 10 million it was worth before. But we haven't lost the asset. But from an accounting standards point of view, that uncertainty means write it off to zero. So it's just things like that. Now, I don't know what the number is worth. It could be worth zero going forward if we lost the court case and everything went bad. But that's clearly the worst case outcome, not the average or best case outcome. So just bear that in mind and, and hence why I prefer look through. Because... um. The statutory numbers just don't make a lot of sense for a business like us. In the same way, they don't for Sol Pats and they don't for Berkshire Hathaway. Not that I think, you know, I'd love to be compared to them one day. I don't think we're anywhere close to their size, yeah. obviously. But it's worth, you know, just the same way as you wouldn't say Buffett's only got a return on equity of 3% and Sol Pats has only got a return on equity of a few percent. You know, don't make the same mistake with us. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that clarification there. Now, just one last one to finish it off today. A participant that asks, uh, you use a modified version of the uh, yeah, conscious investor software to help assess your active investment opportunities. This software is trying to achieve an 85% success rate. Is that roughly how it has panned out? Yeah, pretty much. I did this analysis in a letter, I think, two years ago, the annual report, or was it last year, uh, annual report, one of the two, sorry. Um, I can find it if people really want. But I, I set out, you know, success and failure in our opinion at the time. Yeah. And it was sitting at around that 80, 85% mark. And um, if you most recent letter in the annual report, I showed the money on invested capital of all of our investments. And again, you can look through that and you see it's about 85% have an MOIC of greater than one. Um, yeah. Obviously one means we got all that money back. 
So an MOIC of less than one, we're still hoping to get our money back, whether that's just going to take time or it just never worked out. Um, more than one, we've already got back what we put in. So uh, roughly 80% or more of them are sitting on an MIIC of greater than one, um, some many times one. Um, but yeah, I think that, that number's about right. Um, and, and it's what we're aiming for. If it was ever materially different, we'd be trying to tweak the filters to, to try and be more selective or, or wider. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, well, thank you for that one there. Andrew, well, that realistically takes us to the end, mate. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? No, look, just thank you so much for your time, Sharewife. Really, really appreciated it. Um, I think it's great that uh, getting the opportunity to talk to your people and, and the broader market like this. And I think really all I'd leave you as a thought of is that, um, you know, our unique advantage, our competitive advantage at TIP is our ability to compound knowledge and wealth. And therefore, as a long-term investment, I think we have some significant advantages. And that's why we're so keen on our story. And we invite you to look at it and hopefully be as keen as we are. Um, obviously, if you're not, then that's totally your call as well. But we, we're really excited by it. We really think we've got huge opportunities ahead and no foreseeable ending of that runway. And so, you know, I'm really excited to be part of this company and, and I hope you all are as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Pip. And thank you very much, Andrew, for your time and expertise, mate. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your day.